Welcome to the Cavalry Prizes 2016, where we come every two years to Oslo in Norway to celebrate some of the finest achievements and the finest minds in science, in astrophysics, in nanoscience and neuroscience. In the words of the founder, Fred Cavalry, the biggest, the smallest and the most complex. Uh, my name is Adam Rutherford and I have the privilege every two years of interviewing the laureates, the winners of the Cavalry Prize. And today we're starting with the very, very biggest. Uh, big on a cosmic scale, I think it's fair to say, because on September the 14th, 2015, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, better known as LIGO, detected a pulse of gravitational radiation emitted by the collision of two black holes. The discovery has, in a single stroke, validated Einstein's theory of general relativity. It has established the nature of gravitational waves and it's demonstrated the existence of black holes with masses 30 times that of our sun. It has effectively opened up a new window on the universe. Now, one of the laureates, Ronald Drever, unfortunately due to ill health, cannot be with us, but I'm sitting here with the other two laureates, Kip Thorne from Caltech and Ray Weiss from MIT. So first of all, Gentlemen, congratulations. Oh, it's thank a, you. It's thank an you. astonishing you. achievement and was front page news the, the world over. Were you anticipating such a media splash for such a discovery? No. In fact, to me, that was a big miracle that it should have happened that way. And the only way I could think about it, in fact, that we both thought about how, why is this such a big deal to everybody? Well, the, the only thing, the things you can think of is Einstein was a world hero. So, and uh, that's an interesting story in its own right, how that happened. And then black holes are sort of scary and awful. And they're in science fiction movies and everywhere, even, well, science movies too. And so then, but that, is that enough to do it? And that's probably all I can tell you. I mean, I was puzzled about that, just like you have. Why is it such a big deal? But those are the best I can come up with. Maybe yeah, you have a better But one. I think it deserved to be a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that... Uh, this was, as Gabby Gonzalez, the uh, spokes, spokesperson for the collaboration, said in the, the news conference, this is like Galileo turning an optical telescope on the sky for the first time and opening up optical astronomy, in fact, electromagnetic astronomy. What LIGO did, what the LIGO team of a thousand people did, was open up our first view of the universe in a whole new kind of radiation, gravitational waves. So this is something that has implica implications and will continue to be a major part of astronomy, not just for the next few years or the next few decades, but for the next few centuries. With achievements of that sort of magnitude, as you've just described, I think we have to sort of start at the beginning because it takes an enormous amount of foresight and planning and money and lobbying to keep a project running for for so long for the payoff that happened, well, this, this year and, and last. So where, where, did the, where did the idea originally come from, Kip? It came largely from Ray. Uh, there were others who had the idea in its bare bones form, uh, including uh, two Russians, uh, Gertzenstein and Pustavoid, a little earlier than Ray, though we didn't know about it. Yeah. But what Ray did, in 1972, he wrote a, a paper that is really the most powerful, insightful paper I think I ever read, <laughs> in which he uh, described this method of looking for gravitational waves. He identified all the major source, sources of noise that this would confront in its uh, first incarnation, initial LIGO detectors. He described how to deal with each of them. Uh, and he then made an estimate of what sensitivity you could reach and saw that the sensitivity was at the level that uh, theorists like me were saying the waves would likely be found. And, uh, it was a tour de force in 1972 and sort of became the blueprint for the initial phases of LIGO. So, Ray, if you, if you were the, the, the initial brains behind the idea, what, how, how did you get the team together? Because this is a, oh, well, okay. it's a real team achievement. Let me say, I'm not quite with Kip on this one. There were a lot of people who had good ideas. The idea was in the air, so leave it at that. I mean, there was even work in the United States by people like Bob Forward and uh, most of well, others who had been thinking about this. So, no. I think there's some marvelous things in it and the way you started it and why you say in these 50 years, which is about the time, is that uh, to me the amazing thing is that the country as a whole country, this is all of us, but in particular the people who are responsible for things that go on in science would take the gamble with us. To me, that's the part that's really sort of amazing. I mean here, 
that's really say what's, it's a pretty flaky thing to begin with, let's say. <laughs> no, here's a thing which I and others had calculated would, and especially from the kinds of things that Kip would say the universe was going to able to give you. You're talking about strains, which are the change of the distance between two objects divided by their separation of 10 to the minus 21. Now, imagine that number. It's an infinitesimally small number. Anybody who's an engineer who is a sensible person would say, that's completely crazy. You can't measure that. And so that's number one. And the other one was that even though Kip did a beautiful job of explaining everybody what might be some sources, we were not yet sure that there were really sources of the kind. I mean, they, they were conceptually possible. But astronomers hadn't seen many of these sources yet. But Kip was already imagining them. And so here were these two things. A thing that was very, very hard to measure, and many people didn't believe could be measured. And then the other thing is, even if you got the te technology to make the measurement, okay, you still had to not sure, you couldn't really point to something and say, you're definitely going to see this. And nevertheless, the National Science Foundation in the United States took the gamble to do this with us. And they stuck with it in an you know, unflinching and absolutely you know, constant way for the last 50 years. That's a dramatic thing. And then, and then the U.S. Congress in yeah. 1992 yeah. gave the first large amount of money uh, toward construction. Yeah. And they stu stood with us through changes of administration, changes of congressional leadership between the two parties. They stuck with us unflinchingly also from 92 until the present time. That is remarkable. Remarkable given that we told them from the outset that we were going to build an ish initial set of interferometers of gravity wave detectors that probably wouldn't see anything and have to then build a second set in order to have success. But we had to do it in two stages uh, in order to uh, have a high probability of actually succeeding. It was too big a leap. The fact that both the NSF and the Congress went along with yeah. that and with that strategy, I find remarkable. And reading around the, the subject and the discovery and the citations for, for the various awards that you'll presumably continue to get over the next few years, one of the words that comes up frequently is stubborn. No, I think I don't like that. Stubborn is not the right word. No? No, 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 no. Persistent. No, I don't even want to say that. No, no, no. The, you have to, I'll give it you my version. I'll, Kip will give his. The, my version is very straightforward. I mean, what is that the people who are in this thing First of all, many of them enjoy the technology. They get a kick out of it, and that certainly applies to me. They get a kick out of something. You, you make it, you think about it, and you make it, and it works. The circuit that you designed actually does what you think it does, supposed to have done. Or that beautiful optical thing that you cooked up and designed, it shows a beautiful pattern. And you take a tremendous pleasure in doing that. That's what keeps you going, OK? That's the only half of it, though. And occasionally, but very, most of the time, the people who all of us have worked with and we have had an extremely convivial interaction. We get along with each other. And the thing is that, if that wasn't there, I don't think this thing would have lasted as long as it did. You know, if, if it wasn't a pleasure to do, in both in the things you did in front of you and with the people you're doing it with, I think it probably wouldn't have happened. Do, do you, you know? How do you keep the momentum going for such well, a long period of time? I'm just time. giving you the argument. Yeah. You're dealing with people, you don't want to let the other guy down. Yeah. And on top of that, everybody's having a good time. So you can't beat it. Come on. Well, I think you, you, you can't set aside the issue of the, the vision of what this was going to do in the end. And, they, and, and, and we knew this from the very beginning, that if, if, if these guys could succeed, if this superb experimental team could succeed, that the payoff would be huge. And uh, I couldn't imagine anything with a higher payoff for me to do in my career than to help Ray and his experimental colleagues pull this off. Wow. Now, Ron, Ron Drever has dementia and he can't be with us today. Um, perhaps you both could talk about his contribution to, to the team. He, he was the third member, third yes, founder member so. to join. I'd like to do that because it's important. And Kip will also. Uh, Ron um, is a very interesting physicist. He's a physicist who th has, he thinks mostly in pictures. And certainly when I interacted with him, he thinks in pictures. It's really quite different than many of us think. Many of us think um, they have a, a vague idea, and then you do some calculations, which involve equations, and then discussing with people. But Ron has this vision. When he sees something, he can see it quite clearly and quite differently often than you can. And he had, I mean, uh, Kip says uh, that there were, the original ideas were before Ron. And, I mean, the idea of using timing of light, which is really what the basic idea is. What you do is you time light between masses. 
and that time changes if a gravitational wave comes along and changes the mass, the separation of the masses. That idea, is, as, as Kip says, was, and I, I say, has occurred to many people. But what, when we actually came to doing it, to get the sensitivity that you need, that this remarkably high sensitivity, tiny measurements you have to make, Ron had some very clever ideas about that, especially in the interferometry. In other words, the, the, how you get that extra step in sensitivity. And uh, so uh, some of those ideas came from Ron, but others as well. It turns out it's a, it's a mixture. But Ron was at the forefront of many of those ideas. I can tell you what the ideas were. But the, so he, he, he contributed in a deep way to things that made the idea, the original idea, which was a very simple idea, into something that made an experiment that worked. And yeah. it, I mean, it is a grand engineering project. Well, I'm not talking about engineering. I'm talking about, that's a separate piece. Uh -huh. I'm, talking, I'm talking about how you make the interferometer actually sensitive enough. Look, here's the best way to say it. The wavelength of light is about 10 to the minus 6 centimeters. Okay? And the measurement that we have to make is about 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, if you talk centimeters. That's the kind of motion, 10 to the minus 18 meters. And it turns out to make that transition a factor of about... Uh, you know, 10 to the 10, uh, yeah. Uh, and how do you use light? How do you use light to measure to something that? that's 10, 000, yeah. that's yeah. 10 billion times yeah. smaller than the wavelength of yeah. light? Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Mm. Yeah, and in order, you have to do a whole bunch of tricks. And Ron came up with some of the tricks, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of keeping the momentum going with the three of you working, and I, I, it, it was an engineering project as well as a scientific project. You know, the engineering project, project I, I'll, I'll, I, the reason why I'm arguing with you about the engineering project, that's a, there was also challenges in the engineering, mm. what people call engineering. I'll give you a good example. Uh, one of them was making a vacuum system of the size that was needed. I mean, the vacuum systems on LIGO, the arms, those big long arms that have the laser beams going back and forth in them, are four kilometers long. And if one had done this by conventional methods, by the methods that other physicists have used, like people who make high energy machines, you would have completely costed the project out of the, the, the budget we had for it. And so consequently, a lot of ideas, what I will call real engineering ideas, had to be applied to make the vacuum system cheap enough so that we could afford it. That's a real engineering piece. Okay. And, and see, it's a different thing about how to get the sensitivity for the light. Those, those were yeah. huge engineering challenges, but the physics challenges were also very deep to yeah. get to that level of sensitivity. One way to describe the sensitivity that the advanced detectors that are now operating, when they reach design sensitivity, uh, what they will be achieving is this, that they will be measuring the motions of 40 kilogram mirrors, uh, this size mirrors, uh, measure the center of mass, the center of the mirror's motion, to a precision that is so great that uh, we will be having to deal with them behaving quantum mechanically. That is, there are quantum mechanical fluctuations in the position of the mirrors. We've never seen things of human size fluctuate that way. We know about lots of measurements of fluctuations in the position, location of electrons in atoms, uh, or locations of molecules in, 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 in a light beam. But that a 40 kilogram object has these fluctuations is incredible and that LIGO has to operate at that level and has to deal with it is doubly incredible. So that LIGO in that process has to use concepts that come from quantum information science, the area of quantum computing, quantum cryptography, the ideas coming from there, some of them are built into LIGO to deal with this and this becomes ever so much more so as we move beyond the current generation of LIGO. And when you're, you were thinking about what you were going to be detecting, I mean, the predictions and the calculations about what sort of cosmic events would be generating energy that, that was enough that we would actually pick up what the gravitational waves as, as they reached us, how, how were those computations made? So there were a number of sources we were thinking about. We were thinking about the cores of supernova explosions, uh, where a, a star's core collapses, implodes, forms a neutron star, and then generates an explosion. We were thinking about neutron stars uh, orbiting around each other, colliding and merging. Black holes, which is what we actually saw, colliding and merging. Black holes tearing neutron stars apart. To estimate the strengths of the waves uh, uh, it was uh, the main thing that was needed in order to get going here. 
And already in 1978, Ray and I went to a workshop, uh, participated in a workshop uh, of people who were working in the field. This is 78, this is before we had created the collaboration that became LIGO. And in that workshop, we all looked at the sources and I came to the conclusion that the level of sensitivity that would have to be reached for success was 10 to the minus 21, which is precisely the strength of the waves that were detected. That's so right. we knew that already in 1978 from these estimates for these sources. Uh, that was a separate thing from understanding the waveforms, the wave shapes well enough to feed that into the data analysis. That came much later. But the strengths of the waves, we already knew roughly how strong the waves were when uh, uh, the planning for LIGO was beginning and LIGO had not yet been created. So did you effectively have, you, you had a sort of a lookup table of cosmic events and, and when the signal was detected you could compare it and say, so it's an inference that the, the black holes were of this magnitude. Is it? Well, in the end, it was that uh, you could look at the, at the shape of the wave, how it evolved, the chirp, as we call it, with frequency increasing and the strength increasing. Uh, you could look at it and immediately see this is the kind of thing that you expect when two massive objects spiral together and merge. And then you look at the details of the shape of the waves and you compare it with the waveforms that are predicted from simulations on computers. They match beautifully, unbelievably beautifully. And uh, so it, it was basically an open and shut case uh, on the first signal. No, be careful. <laughs> be careful with that. What, what, I, once you knew the signal was real. Once you well, <laughs> not only that, but no, the, okay. the, the history is, I mean, it, kept, it was deeply involved in making that history. So. But the thing is, it was most of the thinking we had done in the early days. And this, by, by the early days, the days of Joe Weber, when he was thinking he had saw gravitational waves with these big bars he made, and a little bit after that, was that the sources one would try to find, we only knew we knew about, were, were supernova explosions. I mean, the gravitational waves are generated by accelerating mass. And the only thing we could knew, we only knew about, I mean, that people who had done astronomy knew about, was uh, that stars implode. And that has a hell of a lot of acceleration and must make gravitational waves, if it's aspherical enough to do it. And so in the early designs, I mean, some of our numbers were ludicrous. They said, well, 1% of the energy that we might experience comes out of a supernova might go into gravitational waves. I mean, that was a simple-minded thought that you could have had. And some of the designs were based on things like that. Later, we found out two things. There was a discovery of pulsars, which was very important. And in fact, um, the early paper that I wrote tried to figure out how could you detect a pulsar, because that one you could see and you know about. But you didn't know how much, how aspheric a pulsar was. But the real thing that happened was that, uh, I think a critical thing was, is what happened with Hulse and Taylor, which is uh, uh, Russell Hulse and, and Joe Taylor had been radio, have, were radio astronomers that had found a pulsar that was moving, at, it had a rep repetition rate of sort of uh, 17 pulses per second. And they noticed that it wasn't absolutely steady. And they noticed that it was sort of changing at a, with a period of one every, every eight hours, it would go through going a little faster, going a little slower, that pulse rate. And they were persistent about it. In this case, persistence is the right word, because they really just had, they measured it and kept measuring it. And they were able to make a model of that system, which considered of two neutron stars, which is a well, pulsar is a neutron star, a star made of nuclear matter, about the size of uh, Oslo, or pick any big city, that's about the size. And, uh, and these were going around each other, and you could see this orbital change that was due to the Doppler term of the two stars going around each other. And that was the very first evidence that people had that pulsars lived together. And then immediately, the ideas that people had in that Battel conference that Chip was talking about became reality. In other words, pairs of neutron stars, he suddenly, oh yeah, here's one we see. Mm. And that became very important. And once you had that, you had that confirmation that nature actually had pairs of neutron stars. That changed our whole thinking about what we should aim for. And another event that happened, very serious event that happened, <coughs> is that 1987A supernova that we all, well, it was a, one of the supernovas where instrumentation existed on the Earth and you could measure, and it was close enough so you could measure some interesting things. <coughs> and one of the most interesting things that came out of it is you saw neutrinos come out of it, and we recognized then that neutrinos were gonna do most of the energy release of that system and not gravitational radiation. So that 1% dropped to some tiny number. Well, the other thing that yeah. happened was just a little, a little bit before yeah. 1987A, yeah. 
that uh, the high energy theorists, the uh, fundamental physics theorists, uh, they uh, discovered that they had the theory of the interaction of neutrinos with uh, uh, with other forms of matter wrong, hmm. and uh, they reworked that. And uh, when they reworked it, they found that instead of the core of a star that's imploding, trigger supernova going in and bouncing sharply, it would more ooze down because mm -hmm. of the neutrinos yeah. being trapped. And that drove the estimated wave strengths from uh, supernovae way down. So we were on in the, uh, in the mid 70s when we were thinking about supernovae. We didn't have the physics right. Uh, that got straightened out. Uh, but uh, the other thing, as Ray says, was the uh, discovery of binary pulsars, mm -hmm. the recognition that two compact objects going around each other would be a great source. And then we started thinking about neutron star binaries and black hole binaries, which then became our prime source right. uh, by the early 1980s when we were proposing LIGO. And remarkably, didn't change. Our, our idea of the strength of those waves didn't change much from then until now. Uh, and uh, we are, again, we're still in the 10 to the minus 21 ballpark. Well, you know, related to that is this thing. We are, once we knew about the binary neutron stars, that became sort of the, the benchmark we had for all ex designs of the instrument. We would say, well, if, if we see a few binary ne neutron star systems in our own galaxy, you could project out and figure out what kind of sensitivity you would have to have so you could pick up some in distant galaxies. And you could sort of get a very poor, but you get an estimate for the rate of these things. And much of our design criteria that were involved, both in how we worked with the initial detector and then worked with the, the advanced detector we, ha we had now, were based on estimates we would make, or try to make, not us, but people who understood you know, how to do the estimates better. Kip obviously did. I didn't. Uh, the, that would then say, well, okay, if we do this change in the apparatus and improve the sensitivity in this particular region, that in a region of the spectrum of the gravitational radiation spectrum, we could probably enhance the ability to see these things. Now, the thing we knew about, but we couldn't calculate, were black holes. See, I mean, the idea that black holes would radiate and it, that was well, almost the same time as you yeah. were doing all the calculations yeah. for any of these compact binaries. But the thing nobody knew is... They knew there were black holes, that much we knew. There were big ones and there were stellar ones. The X-ray astronomers had found some, but nobody had seen any binary black holes, ones going around each other. And that's the other big discovery that came from this thing in, in, in uh, just last year, mm -hmm. was that we found that not only do this solar, 30 solar mass black hole, it's not alone, it lives with another one. And that changed the whole character of the way we now can look at the thing. When we design apparatus or think about the future, we say, ah, we now know that there are binary black holes, and we can use them as standard objects all over the universe if we want. Does that mean that yeah. now that you know what you're looking for and now that gravitational waves have been validated uh, as, as a concept, are we just going to see them more and more? Oh, yeah. No, that was, that's Kip was saying. I mean, that's, in fact, the future is extremely interesting uh, because we now have a pretty good idea because of the two that we've seen, and I think we actually have seen three, but one is not, you know, not that good. But you know that they all look the same to me, and so I'm going to use that as the basis. It's just like two thirds of a difference. Uh, and now you can say, oh, if we improve the apparatus by two, by a factor of two, we're not going to see one every month. We're going to see one every couple of days. Really? Yes. But those those cosmo cosmological events—they're they, not that rare. That, that no, 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 no. Yeah, once we... you see, look, what's the idea? Once you have a, a distance, you have some some objects, okay, and you know how far you are looking. You know how big a volume of the universe you're looking at. And if you make some not terribly crazy assumptions about that the volume of the universe you've looked at now isn't going to be very different as if you could go further out and look at more volume of the universe. And that's the assumption we make, that there isn't a very big evolutionary term in that as you look further, there are less of them or more of them. Let's say it's supposed to be the same as a, now. See, you can predict pretty well. If you improve the apparatus by two, you look twice as far out in the universe that means you're seeing a volume that's two to the cube, two times two times two, more volume of the universe. And we have three, one, of, one event per month, multiplied by the cube of, of two is 30, right? We get one, one a day, one, three, get one a day but that's a little, <laughs> yeah. that's a little too good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, but yeah. that's just the black hole binaries. Yeah. By the time we reach the current instrument's design sensitivity, advanced LIGO's design sensitivity, in about two years or so, 
Uh, that's a factor three improvement in sensitivity, three cubed or uh, 27, about 30 times higher event rate. We should not only be seeing uh, several black hole binaries per, uh, per week, we should by then be seeing neutron stars colliding, black holes tearing neutron stars apart. If we're lucky, we'll see a supernova. Uh, and we'll very likely be seeing something we didn't predict, something yeah. very surprising. And that's just the beginning because the experimental team, the younger generation, they have plans on the drawing boards for further improvements. Two more generations of instruments are on the drawing boards, uh, which will get us a huge additional factors, uh, increased by ultimately a, a, another factor of a thousand or more in volume. Uh, in, in volume. Yeah. Uh, and over the period between now and, say, uh, the 2030s. Uh, and God knows what we're going to see then. It's, it, it's, it, you're just exploring a new side of the universe that we've never seen before. But, and it turns out that now we have the equipment to detect it. The universe is bathed in these things. And the universe is, can... ba is bathed in these things. And, and this is just one frequency band. You know, in electromagnetic astronomy, we began with optical telescopes. Then there were radio telescopes looking at waves that had wavelengths that were longer by a factor of uh, 10,000 than light. Then we had X-ray telescopes, infrared telescopes. It's going to be the same way with gravitational waves. We begin with LIGO uh, with wavelengths uh, that are sort of a thousand kilometers or so. And then something called LISA, which are spacecraft that track each other with laser beams uh, uh, that are out in uh, interplanetary space. Separations of uh, millions of kilometers instead of uh, four kilometers. Looking for gravitational waves with wavelengths 10,000 times longer than LIGO. It's the same as going to radio astronomy. And then there uh, is a technique called pulsar timing arrays. We won't go into the details, but uh, a different technique that is likely to succeed within the next 10 years or so, looking for gravitational waves with much longer wavelengths still, and then a technique that uh, is based in, on work that Ray also worked on, on the cosmic microwave background radiation, looking at polarization of it, uh, polarization patterns in the sky to see gravitational waves from the earliest moments of the universe uh, with ultra-long wavelengths. It's, it's like the burgeoning of electromagnetic astronomy. One band, two bands, three bands, four bands. We'll have four frequency bands that we're operating in uh, within the next 20 years, perhaps less than 20 years. Well, it feels like that we're going through a golden age in astrophysics. That, that there's, this is the big one, really. But you know, last year, we were, we were sending New Horizons past Pluto and seeing things that we've never seen before. As we sit here, Juno is sending photos back of Jupiter that we've never seen before. It, d does it feel like this to you that, that we're, we're opening the door to the universe in, a, in an unprecedented way? Yes. Yeah, no, I have to agree. I mean, and, and then one further thing, I mean, I've said it, let me say it a little differently. There's something very special about gravitational waves. And that is, big, and then it, we have suffered by this process I'm about to tell you because they were so hard to detect. I mean, it took us a long time to develop the technology, but then we get a benefit from that. And that benefit is that different than electromagnetic waves, like light or even radio waves, these waves that we get don't get scattered. They just, they're impervious to everything that is between us and the source. They, nothing happens to them. And I'll give you the counter, work, work the example the other way around. And I think still one of the most interesting sources would be what, as Kip says, is the, uh, seeing a supernova for the first time. Now, what we know about supernova, we know from what goes on on the outside of the supernova. We see the light, the neutrinos we see, well, that's pretty deep into it, but most of the stuff we know about supernova come from outer layers of the explosion, of the implosion. Now, what gravitational waves will do is they, since they don't scatter, they, they don't interact with anything, and they get originated by accelerating masses, if when we get a waveform that comes from a supernova, it'll tell us, What's going on deep inside the supernova? For example, is this cluster of stuff coming together and then bouncing, like as Kip was saying, or is it oscillating? Is it doing something like this? Or is it breaking up into two pieces? We will be able to tell that. You can't tell that by any other technique than by gravitational waves because they tell you what's going on deep inside the thing. And that's a different aspect of astronomy than, in fact, we'll probably learn things about things we know about, like a supernova, in ways that we had never been able to see before. 
And as Kip was saying, we also will probably see things you had never seen before by this new technique because they never made signals in, in electromagnetic signals. For example, this pair of black holes, this 30 solar mass black hole pair, I hope we see something when in the further in the future with other of these, but it's not easy to predict what it is that we'll be seeing. We will, we'll be seeing the black holes, but is there also some sort of electromagnetic counterpart that's associated with those explosions or those, those collapses? And some people think it's unlikely, but we definitely will see something that is associated with neutron stars going together. In fact, with neutron stars, we'll learn something really quite spectacular. As they go, they do the same dance that the black holes do, and they will go around, get faster and faster. Then, but before they hit each other, they will be approaching each other to start pushing on each other. They're, they're bigger objects, and they're, they're made of things that are a little bit squishy. You know, at least we'll learn what goes on inside nuclei, how squishy they are, how, how springy they are. And they, that's something we'll see as they get very close together before they really come together, emerge, and make a black hole. And that, again, is something that you cannot see, that part. You cannot see by electromagnetic means. You will have to use the gravitational waves to unscramble that business about the nuclear, the, the, the nuclear springiness. On the other hand, there will be an electromagnetic splash. And we think that splash are, are gamma ray bursts, which are, are seen already. So there is a very active program we have. And that's one thing that, we, again, when you look to the future, this program is very important, which is that we want to be able to have enough gravitational wave detectors so we are not in the pickle we're in right now with the black holes we've detected. See, with the black holes, we, where they are in the sky, we don't know very well. We know two things about that. We know that they're 1.2 or 1.3 billion light years away. That's because we know the equations, we know the masses, and we can calculate using Einstein's equations what the strength should be if it's at a certain distance. So that's a calculation we can make, which is pretty reliable, I think. On the other hand, when you say where in the sky, where should, for example, and a lot, uh, somebody has a telescope point. Well, the best we can do is say, this, look, this hit our, our detectors. It hit one in Louisiana, which is in the southern part, United States first. And then the wave made it seven milliseconds later to, to Washington State, okay? That's there, it sort of sells us. Whatever we saw goes close to the velocity of light. That's sort of interesting fact on its own. And, uh, but all we can tell is it's in some huge region, about 1,000 square degrees of sky somewhere in the south. However, we can say it was far enough in the south that the waves arrived at Earth, they entered the Earth near the South Pole, roughly near the yeah. South Pole, came through the Earth, yeah. then arrived at Livingston, Louisiana, then seven milliseconds later in Hanford, Washington. But what we saw came through the Earth unscathed yeah. by any interaction with the, yeah. all the matter of the so, Earth. And that's what Ray was saying, yeah. was how well, penetrating anyway, the, these the are. The thing anyway, I'm really getting at is yeah. a, a wave of the future, <laughs> yeah. which is the fact of, of and the reason why you probably will hear that people want to make more gravitational wave detectors. Now, let me say a little more about that, because that's very important. The best we can do right now, as, as both of us are saying, is we can say it's in some swath of the sky. And you tell that to an astronomer, and he'll look at you like you're out of your mind. So, okay, point your telescope to where? Come on, tell me. And, no, and so what you, what we, we had hopes, and we have hopes, that at another detector, which was made by the French-Italian team, it's called Virgo, which has operated with us, was going to be an operation for the first detection of that we have made. Well, luckily, unluckily for all of us, they were not quite ready yet. And they, but they will be ready for the next run we're going to make. And that's going to happen sometime this winter. And then we will have, and we will see more detections, I hope, we'll have three detectors looking at it. Now with that, you can do more, you can do more pointing. Because the way we, you can't take the gravitational wave detector and point it in the sky. There's no way. It's sort of uni, it's all in all directions. It's not quite uniform in all directions. That's important, but to first order, it's uniform. Okay, and so what happens is that you then can use the timing differences between well, it gets to to Pisa, which is where this other detector is. Let's say it gets there so half the time between Livingston and and Hanford, or you know, and then you say, oh yeah, well, it's in that part it. of the sky. So, yeah. And so okay, and. Well, it's still not going to do very well. You're going to you get splotches. Now, most of astronomers will be most unhappy until you get them a region of the sky about the size of the sun or the moon. That's about, you know, they'd love to have a thing like that. Then they can carefully go through it. No, we won't be at that stage yet. And so what is very important to this field is that there's another detector of a large size like this that's being built in Japan. That's called the Kagura detector. And that will be operating, we hope, by 2018, 2019. And then there's another detector, which is 
not yet even, it's being planned, but it's not yet built in any way is in, going to be in India. And that's a detector very much like the LIGO detectors, same design, same, it's in fact called LIGO India. And that, with those detectors, the, the, of those five detectors, we should be able to take most of the sky and get angular resolution with a reasonable signal noise, sort of a signal noise of 10 to 1, uh, about the size of the moon. Now that puts us into a regime where you can tie the older field of why we have learned most of the world, what the universe is about, electromagnetic observations, you know, the different wavelengths that Kip was talking about, and we can tie that then to what we discover. And that would be fascinating. You'd say, oh yeah, that signal we see comes from a region where there is a cluster of galaxies that have a pimple on them, or you know, whatever, you know, something like that. And that would make a very big difference for the science that you will get out of this. Now, yeah. we're, unfortunately, we're almost out of time, yeah, yeah. but let, let me just finally ask you this. One of the things that I and many of my colleagues and friends loved about this discovery is that it was science live. The, dis it, the discovery was less than a year ago and we're sitting here discussing it and everyone around the world knows about it. Often science happens over decades and I know it took decades to build, but when the result comes in, everyone knew about it within the space of a few days and that just felt like the way science should be done. We're telling people as soon as you get the data in. Did you get that sort of well, uh, let, buzz let me off answer it. because I don't think it's quite the way you say it is. <laughs> let me tell you what, a lot of people were disappointed how long it took. <laughs> okay? I mean, the discovery was made in September of 1915, uh, 2015, and we published the public result in February of 2016. Six months, about seven months. That's quick. Well, good. I'm glad you think so. I'm <laughs> delighted you think so. But to many of us, we thought that was a very long time. And now what went on during that time? You were checking it. Of course. And that's the thing. That's what's so important about it. I think the next things will take a lot less time. And the reason was that, well, I won't go into all of it, but you can easily imagine we didn't believe what we saw to begin with, right? So it took a lot of time on the part of everybody. All thousand people, really, were involved in many looking at, is it, is it some crazy thing that the apparatus does on its own? Is it somebody who hacked us? Is it a thing that we did to ourselves? I mean, a whole different, all the ideas that existed. And it took that long, really to get to the point that we could publish it with confidence. But uh, yes, so maybe the next one will take a lot shorter. I don't yeah. think six months is any time at all for a discovery <laughs> all right. All right. of this magnitude. <laughs> all it remains for me to do is to congratulate you both and, and Ron Drever. It is a truly universal discovery. And so congratulate well the superb team that really pulled it off in the yeah. end, our colleagues. Now we're symbols for that team. That's the way to yeah. look at it. Yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.